Previously on the Sugar Baby Confessionals. You don't hear about the affair that saves the marriage. Frenchie, somebody that I met online, he was hot as hell. I did have a lot of sympathy for his wife. That woman needs to get the fuck out of Dodge. I've cheated on people before, definitely. With, with certain people, I wish I could just be honest with them. I don't know if my children would need to have that level of detail. They wouldn't understand. In this episode, we're interviewing the Brit, Ruby's favorite sugar daddy. He of the beanbag, sexy scrunch times. Okay, this is where I have to take off my good journalist hat and acknowledge some things. Namely, I'm not sure I was entirely fair or unbiased towards the Brit. I love Ruby, but I also love FP. I've known him for years and we have a shared history. So, with the best will in the world, it was very difficult for me to maintain a neutral attitude in the following interview. Having said that, it was enormously game of the Brit to even talk to me about all of this. For that, he gets the Brass Balls Award. It's a very big award that unfortunately only exists in my head. Without his cooperation, I would never have been able to get an insight into a true sugar daddy's mind. So I apologize to him in advance if I sometimes can't help but sound a wee bit partisan. As you'll hear though, he's a pretty cool customer, so I doubt he'll mind. Here we go. We've been referring to you as the Brit all along, and it's nice to kind of put a voice to this nebulous entity. <laughs> I've been called worse than that, but <laughs> nebulous entity doesn't sound terribly flattering. <laughs> well, um, yeah, now now there's a person, you're a person-shaped entity, so that's good. I'm just going to ask you a few highly personal, intrusive questions. What made you, you sign up to being a sugar daddy in the first place? Why not just go do online dating? Uh, well, uh, I didn't want to particularly do a sugar daddy thing. That wasn't my original plan. But on the traditional online dating, the only interest that I got was from people in their mid-40s onwards, because I'm uh, in my early 50s, and all those people were uh, immensely boring. Uh, what now? All mostly came into the category of... Okay, dude. Choose your words carefully. Uh, mothers. Ew, mothers. They're the worst. Divorced with uh, two or three children, uh, rather mumsy people, not interested in anything particularly exciting in life. And uh, I just didn't uh, meet anybody that interested me or got me excited. Yikes. Not a great start. Writing off a whole age group of women as mumsy and boring? I mean... But I have to strive for neutrality. This is about me learning more about his motivations, not pointing out hypocrisy. But it is sort of aggravating to hear a wealthy man basically stating that for him, women have a sell-by date. I know, shocker. On top of that, Ruby is a mum. Is this something the Brit has forgotten? Or is she more appealing simply because she happens to be 20 years younger than him? <sighs> no judgement. A friend of mine I was talking to said to me, well, why don't you try a sugar daddy site? And I said to him, don't be so ridiculous. Why would I do that? And he said, well, you're more likely to find somebody younger that you like that way. So I did. Hold up. Hold the phone. More likely to find someone that you like? I think he's trying to be delicate here. But seriously, why not meet someone at a bar or have a friend set him up? Is there something about the transactional nature of the sugar baby arrangement that appealed, or is he tacitly acknowledging that he was having trouble attracting much younger women? His unmumsy demo. So, yeah, I came up with Ruby very quickly inside the first week of being on the site. Okay, so you didn't go on any other sugar baby dates? No. Well, I did, yes, I, but unsuccessful. Um, I met a couple of youngsters, uh, but I wasn't really interested in somebody that was you know, under 20. So uh, <laughs> that, that just felt really a bit strange, meeting people who were young enough, to, were younger than some of my nieces. Ah, that's good. His target demo has a lower limit. Yeah, I, I met Ruby and that kind of worked much better than I thought it would. 
Can you sort of describe the first time you guys met? Yeah, we agreed to meet at a little shopping area near me that's got some cafes and bars and a couple of uh, restaurants, shops, uh, nice little informal. Ruby was in town anyway for something else, so it suited her too. Well, it's hard to make a friend in the city. It's hard for everyone here. When the day goes in a click, your intentions fade with it. So hard to make the city your friend. I was there first and I had a cup of coffee and I was waiting and she appeared from over the other side of the courtyard. And at first I wasn't certain it was her. Well, you can imagine you don't want to uh, acknowledge somebody in case it's not them. <laughs> But it was fairly obvious pretty quickly that it was her. And I was pleasantly surprised because I'd only seen one picture, I think, on the site or a couple. And very often people's pictures are, let's say, (laughs) flattering. And she was as good looking as her pictures on the site. So that was nice. I was nervous. The first time I'd done anything like that. And I think she was a little nervous as well. But we settled down into a very simple conversation very quickly and it all seemed very uh, comfortable and natural. What was it about her profile? If, the, if she didn't have loads of pictures, that struck you? Yeah, this could sound terrible, but you know, I put in a set of criteria and only a very small number of people came out. You know, If I'd been on there for longer, there might have been more. I think I only sent messages to two or three people on the site in total. And I had then met Ruby before I had any contact. No, I think I saw one other person before. So I was just attracted to the picture. And, and I can't remember exactly what she'd written on the site, but it just sounded friendly. And she had a friendly face. And I thought that one looks like it might be OK. It should be a safe first meeting. Ask if there was any awkwardness when it came to talking about payment. At the first meeting, we just agreed that we liked each other and that we would talk about the payment, etc., uh, later by email, which is what we then did. So there was no awkwardness around that, and the meeting was uh, was fine. And I am scared. I have lost what was behind. The main thing that people find probably tricky about this is is the idea of payment. I mean, did that stick in your craw a bit, the idea of payment, or you you just sort of resigned to it because that's what the process is? I was very uncomfortable about it. It didn't feel right to me in lots of ways, but I'm in that phase of my life where everything that seemed right before turned out maybe not to be, and the, you know, the second half of my life, I want to be different. So run a bath, stroke my face, and we will be redeemed. So... I just said, well, look, you know, I'll do it, see how it goes. Having met the person, it didn't really feel uncomfortable or or dirty or in any way, Mm. you know, in the gutter. So I thought, well, I'll go with it and see how things progress. And if if I get uncomfortable with it, then I can stop at any time. But no, I, I was uncomfortable about it. It's not what I wanted to do when I started the process. When you say you want to do, you wanted to do the second half of your life differently, what was it? In sort of broad strokes about your, the first half that you, you weren't satisfied with? Well, it wasn't that I wasn't satisfied with it. I had a great first half of my life. I was involved in a, the business world, very successful, got to the top of a very large corporation. Hmm. The kind of thing that lots of people would say was um, you know, hugely successful, uh, except that it ran my life. The rest of the world ran my life. I wasn't making any of these decisions about what I did. I did what corporate life required me to do. 
and it was pretty much 24-7 and it cost me my marriage and I found myself not doing so much of the things that I liked to do. The further up the organisation I got, the more political and corporate it became and less to do with the trading of the early days, which I loved. So I just decided I'd had enough. So I quit my job, left my wife, because that seemed like a bit of an adventure. Right, so what kind of things, what, what, what sort of adventures are you, are you going on at the moment? What kind of things do you like to do? I do long distance cycling and uh, hiking and uh, mountaineering, mostly. I wouldn't cross anything off the list if it's a proper adventure. Uh-huh. A group of, of friends and uh, I have been doing this sort of thing for about the last 10 years. We try and do one or two trips a year. To various parts of the world to do various things. So this kind of sugar baby thing sounds like very much of a piece with this adventuring lifestyle. It seems like you're doing something that's a bit dangerous, a bit edgy. Is that a part of the appeal for you, that there's a slight sort of dark side to it? or? No, I don't think it was actually. It was a means to an end. It was something I wasn't desperately comfortable with, but it was worth a try. I didn't feel that it was in any way risky. There aren't people in my life who would disown me if they knew about it. It's not as if, you know, I'm doing it behind the back of of my wife. It just was a means to an end. So what were your hesitations then? I suppose it was just that I've been brought up uh, to think that it seems a bit like prostitution. You know, it's sex for money. In my world as it was, that's just something that's wrong. It's seems exploitative. I was uncomfortable with that element of it as well, which is why when I met Ruby and found that she was married and that her husband knew and that she was doing it because it was an adventure for her rather than it was just for financial gain, that made me very comfortable and able to carry on with a degree of impunity. Would you have gone ahead with it if if circumstances had been different, if she had been perhaps doing it behind her husband's back or...? No, I wouldn't, no. Did you have any expectations for a sugar baby person that you wouldn't have had for a normal date? Were you sort of like, well, I'm paying for this, so, you know, (laughs) here's my list of... uh, of demands. No, I didn't have a list of demands. I was trying I just wanted to, to to meet somebody that I would like and get on with and have fun with. I decided from my failure elsewhere that that was probably an age related thing and that by going down the sugar daddy route that would be less of an issue and I might meet somebody that I liked and could get on with. I thought I would probably have to meet quite a few people before I found somebody that I liked on this route because I felt that that people doing it probably would be of a type, which I now understand is probably wrong. I would have thought that she is actually quite unusual in her circumstances. Um, Well, I think you might be right, but I don't know that either because she's the only one I know. I (laughs) I, I met a couple but not to get to know. Right. Um, So with the other ones that you met briefly, that you didn't have a chance to sort of find out why they were doing it themselves or if they had, you know, partners who knew or didn't know. No, they were both young and single and really only doing it because their financial circumstances required it. Right. And and that wasn't what I was looking for at all. I mean, I suppose uh, with Ruby, it's, it's kind of, as you say, it's like an adventure with her for her. So she's getting sort of as much out of it, apart from the money, as you are. She did have other encounters with, with other sugar daddies. We haven't really talked about them in any detail. Would that have made you feel uncomfortable for her to carry on with the other sugar daddies? Well, at the start, that was part of the deal. You know, I, mm. my assumption was that I might not be the only person she was seeing, and she confirmed that very early on. She, she didn't mislead me at all. So, yeah, I was comfortable with that. In fact, that made me feel a little bit safer. This wouldn't lead to any kind of emotional involvement because I wasn't necessarily looking for that at the beginning. 
So I was very comfortable with it. What were your thoughts about her and her relationship with FP, which is what we call her husband, when she told you about this uh, sort of open relationship thing that they have? As far as I know, I have not met anybody else in a relationship like that, but I think that possibly I have and didn't know it. Mm. Uh, because mm. in this particular case, uh, they're not... Although it's an open relationship, they're not open about it with their broader family and friends. So th this may be a more widespread phenomenon than I'm aware of. And it seemed odd to me, I have to admit. It seemed really strange. I couldn't imagine myself being in a situation like that. Why not? In a way, it's, it's not that different from being involved with a sugar baby who perhaps is going on dates with other sugar daddies. So I guess, in a way, you're sort of opening yourself up to something similar. Yeah, I suppose I am. Uh, so I couldn't imagine myself being in FP's shoes. You know, I'm reasonably comfortable with my role in this triage. I still find hard to uh, comprehend, though I'm, I'm understanding it better all the time the more I think about it. What would you say is the difference, though? I mean, is it the fact that, that they are married? Is that purely why you find it slightly more difficult to understand? Or do you, do you feel like once you're in a committed relationship, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand the, the cook-holding thing? Or... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's about the long and the short of it. You know, in my life, that would have been something that I would have found unacceptable if it had been my wife saying, I want to go out and meet other people and I want to be a sugar baby. I would have said, well, that doesn't really sound like a great idea to me. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd rather you didn't. Wait a minute. Isn't he in the same position as FP in this situation? Part of a trio with Ruby at its centre? Ergo, he is a part of that sort of relationship, but he's talking about it like if it was a quote, real relationship, such as the one he had with his wife, he'd be totally against it. Has he changed, or is Ruby more invested than he is? I don't quite understand how other people are able to square that and say, yeah, fine, off you go, you know, have fun. Have fun. I think what is fascinating about this situation is this process sort of also opened my mind to a lot of different types of relationships and then I've gone off and sort of researched bit, various bits and pieces of it. And I feel like my brain is being cracked open slightly. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden you're just looking around everywhere and thinking, you know, does this person have an open relationship? Is that person? It would be much easier things. if they all had to wear a bright yellow hat. <laughs> Or something like that, so everyone else knew, wouldn't it? That would be really helpful. A scarlet S for sugar baby. I'm gathering from what everyone has been saying that it's still a learning process. And although FP, he enjoyed the process of Ruby going off and having affairs and then coming back and telling him about it. That was part of his sort of kink. Now that there is our emotions involved, it's slightly more complicated. Yeah, um, I think that's right. <laughs> I mean, how, how do you feel about that? The fact that he there's another person that you you are kind of your actions are sort of impacting on positively or negatively. Yeah, I'm actually reasonably uncomfortable about that, and I've talked to Ruby about that a few times. You know, I I don't want what I do to have a bad impact on anybody. Mm. You know, at the beginning of this, this was around. You know, I'd moved out to another country. I didn't know that many people. I wanted some female company, and uh, but I didn't want another relationship. I wasn't in a rush to to, to get married again. You know, I'm mm. married for a very long time. I just wanted something relatively easy that didn't harm anybody, mm. and uh, that's how it started. And now it's developed into something where I realise that I am a fly in the ointment of their life which I am a little bit uncomfortable with, but on the basis that it could be stopped at any time. And I think this is very much an issue for them to resolve rather than an issue that I have created. This is something that's happened in Ruby's world. And if it wasn't me, it may well have been somebody else. And, and I haven't searched out this current situation and I don't think I've done anything to create it. Then I'm happy to let it run its course and if it reaches the point where you know, it no longer is acceptable to them, then it'll have to end, which I'd be sad about. You know, I'm not sure I believe him. 
I wouldn't want to try and continue it if it were causing distress. It must be so odd for you to think of her having a whole separate life with kids and uh, family members who can't obviously hear about this side of her life, can't accept it, that you're not a part of. Not really. Oh, okay. Uh, it was what I was looking for at the beginning. No, I, I didn't want to be fully involved in somebody's life. I mean, quite enjoying being a single person again. Um, but I didn't want my life to be uh, devoid of female company. I like being with, uh, with them and I like their sense of humour. I enjoy their company. And so I wanted some of that in my life without necessarily the whole thing. Again, I've got to point out that I don't like how he's homogenizing all women into one weird entity. Like, we all have this quirky sense of humor, this essential yet indefinable femaleness. But he only wants some of it. Not too much, just some. Just the right amount. So it started off in that sense, and that was perfect. The fact that she has developed the feelings she has. She has developed the feelings she has. I'm worried now. Is this a one-sided relationship? I'm happy to let it run its course and see. You know, if something lovely comes out of it, that would be great. If it doesn't, well, that wasn't my expectation at the beginning, and so be it. I ask him what he means by something lovely. If he happy with the situation, him going on adventures and having Ruby to himself in between. I'm really interested in what he envisions when he talks about this. Because, honestly, I'm finding it really difficult to get an emotional bead on him. To be honest, I can't see a particularly happy ending. Wait, what? I, I can't see a situation which is likely to make everybody happy, but I don't think my continued involvement is going to make it worse. Ruby thinks that there is the possibility of a happy ending and a nice solution. I think I'll just go with it and see how that develops. And if she's right, that's great. And if not, well, it's not. I try a different tack, hoping to lull him into revealing himself through the use of, uh, humour. How would you feel about a duel at dawn? Is that... Only if it's with swords. <laughs> it's with, um, it's with wet haddock. Oh, no, no, that's way too messy. <laughs> but being serious, I, I wouldn't want it to come to any kind of duel. I think if it's a case of Ruby having to make a choice, then she should choose him and her children uh, first. I guess this is the Brit being a gentleman and bowing out. But how could he possibly know if their marriage ending was an inevitability? And if there's no way of knowing, then by his own argument, shouldn't he bow out before anything like that could happen? But if she chose you, would that be a complicated? Well, look, I hope, I hope if I thought that was going to happen and that me walking away would prevent that, and, and there's, that's not a certainty in itself. Yes. Then I would, because I don't want to be the agent of that sort of disharmony and sadness. They're a very happy couple with three lovely children when I appeared, and I didn't appear with any malintentions. Mm. The idea that that would be the outcome horrifies me, and I would do whatever it took to stop that. If what's happening between them is inevitable and I can't do anything about that, then, well, you know, I'd see how that went. As you say, it could have been something that happened anyway. These could just be perhaps catalyzing influences. Let's talk about when you and Ruby first started to realize that this was kind of shifting from being a bit of fun to being something more. Uh, relatively early, I think. After a month or so, six weeks, something like that. What happened? Two things, I suppose. One, her behaviour towards me and the way she looked at me were more than just the behaviour and looks of somebody who quite likes you, but it's no more than that. Was there not a part of you that was like, well, geez, she's good. I mean, she's putting the effort in for the money, you know. Did I sign up for premium service? I don't know. I never really thought about it as value for money. In fact, I made a conscious effort of just not thinking about the money because if I thought about that, I would have stopped it probably. I'm very uncomfortable about the whole money side of it. So I, don't, I, I actively try not to think about it that way. It's odd he's being so coy about the money. 
Here's a person who made a choice to, essentially, pay for sex. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He went on a site that catered to sugar daddies, signed up, and picked someone he liked. It's not like the money is something Ruby snuck up on him. I guess it's just that I find it a little disingenuous to be talking about feeling uncomfortable this far down the line. I liked her a lot. Quite early on, it became apparent that there was a little bit more to this than just a physical relationship. We clearly got on really well and liked each other's company and laughed a lot and, and all those things that happen between people when they um, start to fall in love. Did that worry you at all? Like, yeah. Was there a moment where you were like, damn, you know, I actually just wanted a bit of fun and this is kind of deepening a bit? And Yeah, uh, yeah it did. <laughs> Very early on, when I realised that was what was happening, I did think very seriously about stopping it because that wasn't what I'd signed up for, that wasn't what I was looking for. But the annoying thing about it was that I had similar feelings for her. Yes, it's so annoying when that happens. And that made it more difficult. You know, if it had been somebody that I liked but didn't have any great feelings for and I thought, oh, this is getting a bit serious on her side, I would probably have just said, thanks, but I'm busy. Mm -hmm. But that was a bit difficult for me to say because I was really enjoying that relationship and had the same kind of feelings growing. Finally, I feel some genuine emotion coming from the Brit. Have I broken through his defences at last? Sometimes I think to myself that I missed the opportunity and should have done that, and other times I think, well, thank God I didn't. The tiny nub of truth beneath the ironclad caution he's projecting is that maybe he always felt more strongly for her than he's letting on. Maybe, despite everything he says about pulling back if he thought her family's happiness was threatened, he could never have done it, because he loves her. Was he really hanging on despite his reservations, because he, perhaps for the first time in his life wasn't in control of the situation, I'm still not sure. Over the past few weeks, Ruby's been talking about the Brit more and more. She's mentioned FP's unease about the situation and how it's causing fights, problems. I'm worried for them, for their relationship, but I don't know what to do about it. Have you guys actually said I love you to each other? Or oh Rachel? yeah, uh, lots of times now. Who there said was, it uh, first? Ruby did, but that was uh, months ago now. I should probably mention here that Ruby told me the first time she said she loved him was during sex. So, make of that what you will. Do you think you'd felt the same way, but you kind of were holding back a bit because of those hesitations you, talk, you were talking about? And then when she said it, did it kind of push you towards carrying on with it? or? Well, I had similar kind of thoughts, and then when she said it, I ignored it. <laughs> I said nothing straight away because I was a bit... well. Uh, Quite. You know, I just thought, oh, I'd probably best say nothing at this moment. Yeah, that probably was a, a good idea. Ruby told me that she'd told uh, her husband that uh, she loved me, which, was a, which shocked me, actually. And I think it wasn't that she decided it was a good thing to tell him. I think that he worked out from things that she was saying and asked her, and she said yes. When I think about how complicated it is to be in a, a relationship with one person, you know, and all their foibles and compromises and all this kind of stuff, to, you're essentially in, in a relationship with two people. Well, I'm not. Uh, you, Ruby is. You, you kind of are, though, only in the sense that something that a favourite person does can impact you. I do worry about it a little, but I don't have to think about it. Right. Did you catch that? I blurted out favourite person, which I wasn't intending to do. I wonder if he noticed and put it together that that's what FP stands for. If he does, how does he feel about that? More importantly, is it still true? You know, my relationship is with Ruby and we only meet at uh, my place or in, you know, in town and stuff, but we, you know, we meet here and um, I don't have to negotiate uh, with a third party. You know, it's, uh, that's all stuff that, that she does. So I'm reasonably insulated from it. I don't begin to understand how she does that, copes with it, but she does. And she seems very comfortable with it and not at all alarmed by it. And so I don't think it's my role to tell her that she should be alarmed. I think it's clear from the statement that the Brit has no intention of breaking up with Ruby. 
like a risky business venture, he's going to take a punt on the outcome and see what happens. On the one hand, it's understandable. Why should he care about whether Ruby's marriage works out or not? She's a big girl, and she explicitly told him that FP is fine with what she's doing. Should he give up on something that he wants on the off chance that it causes ruptures in Ruby's marriage? And who's to say won't end up improving their marriage by giving Ruby the freedom she needs to explore this side of herself? He's leaving it in Ruby's hands, absolving himself of responsibility in the process. She obviously feels that it's worth trying. Yeah, yeah, she clearly does. It is tough. I don't know whether it's a wonderful thing or a terrible thing. I think only time is going to tell. I must say, though, that I've always admired and I still admire, like, how open she is and honest she is with with how she feels and how willing she is to try things. That's definitely not a trait that is common, I think. You know, I I mean, I'm such a blimmin' scaredy cat. I I wouldn't... I tell her that I have to live vicariously through her. I think she is quite rare. I don't think there are many like that. No, no, I don't think so. The sort of smuttiness or whatever it is that you associate with the idea of sugar baby or the exploitation thing doesn't seem to apply to her. No, there's there's no smuttiness about it. I, I don't feel that at all. And and I've, I'm, I just feel very lucky about that because I went into this uh, looking for something but with relatively low expectations of finding it. And I've ended up finding something which is possibly way better than anything I could have expected. Possibly way worse. Uh, <laughs> who, who knows? But at the moment, probably way better than I could ever have imagined. When you agreed to talk to us, I was kind of expecting that you'd have loads of sort of battle stories of, you know, having dated a few sugar sugar babies, you know, sort of being a bit cynical or something. But it seems like this was quite new for you as well. Yeah, this was an experiment that went wrong in the right way. Do you know anybody, like your friend who suggested it, that have been involved in this world? As far as I know, I know nobody else in any kind of similar or remotely similar situation. Which is a shame, really, because I haven't got anybody to talk to about it. <laughs> That's, I guess, the problem for Ruby as well, is that she can't talk to... I'm possibly the the one outlet that she has to really discuss it fully and kind of have a, a non-judgmental, I hope, ear. Because her whole family, unlike yourself, who you're quite... It seems like you're quite lucky in that there isn't a group of people who would con- sort of condemn you or maybe judge you. She's got people in her life that would be absolutely distraught if they found out, you know, that she was... Never mind the sugar baby thing, which would probably kill everyone stone dead. But yeah, uh, you know, just just the idea of the open relationship, people would find it very difficult to understand. Religious family members and things like that. So yeah, maybe you're you're the more evolved ones. This yeah, who be, knows? This would be how everybody's living. You know, is a, a a thing called the Savage Love Cast where it's this guy called Dan Savage in America and he, he, he sort of gives sex advice. And if you listen to that podcast, you, you start realising that there are so many different ways of having relationships, so many different sexual kinks. I wonder how I didn't get my eyes open a little earlier in life. But, you know, so <laughs> At the ripe, it, the ripe it age of... <laughs> I'm only ther- going to therapy twice a week now. <laughs> I'm glad you, you weren't like wearing a lounge lizard outfit, you know, with gold chains. Yeah, w- whatever uh, sugar that is, is supposed to look I, exactly. like. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't even I, know what that is. I don't think I'm a typical one. I don't know. Yeah, what we need to do is find some really hardened, cynical guy that we can hold up as a... Because you, you're far too nice. This is, you know... Sorry. How are we going to teach yeah, the... I'll, uh... I'll work on it. <laughs> What's the moral lesson here? What are we going to take away at the end? I mean, what do you think about that? The idea of morality and love? How does it, you know, does it come into it at all? Well, certainly my ideas are changed because I think, uh, you know, a year ago, if a member of my family had told me that they were in the same situation then as I am now and had explained what had happened, I'd have thought that was really weird and I probably would have been a bit judgmental about it. And equally, if on day one of this I'd known how it would evolve, I would probably have said, no, thank you, that's not for me. And it's evolved at a rate that I have been capable of learning and adjusting to. I think if it had been any faster, I wouldn't have done. It's all seemed very fast to me. And suddenly I look back on it and things I now understand and think, OK, well, that's, a, that's acceptable. I get that. Only fairly recently I would have said, oh, no, that's wrong. 
that's not right. Mm. So yeah, I'm learning and going through the, that process at the moment too. And uh, and quite enjoying it. Well, more than quite enjoying it. I was going to say. I mean, it would be a very strange thing to do if you weren't if you weren't having a bit of fun. Ruby's been dying to join us, so finally I let her. So how did it go? <laughs> it's shocking. I couldn't crack him. You are going to have to come up with a hardball question that's going to reduce him to tears. Ay, Dios mío, Sarah. Well, how about this? I'll tell you what I think the essence of him. Yes, is. that's a good, that? good good start. The first thing that comes to my mind is loved ones, particularly his family, but certain very close friends. I think the Brits, what what am I calling you? The wise ones was suggested, (laughs) but I downplayed that. Well, I thought it was wet haddock fighter. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, something to do with wet haddock. Um, (laughs) Whose phone is that ringing in the background? Yours. Is that a a captain of industry calling you? (laughs) Unlikely. (laughs) Will, will billions be falling just because you're, you're saying no to this phone call? It could be that. A company somewhere that. is yeah. like, loses all its stock's value. Yeah, I think you should go and sell all your gold reserves. <laughs> buy coconut oil. Ruby elaborates on the Brit's essence. I find the Brit wonderfully connected. Someone who... I've got under- two telephones. Yeah. I'm really well connected. Someone who really understands other people and does what he needs to do in order to make other people feel comfortable and taken care of and happy. So do you think those qualities made him eminently suitable as a sugar daddy? (laughs) He's got the right skills to be someone As a sugar daddy? No, 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 no. No, those skills made him too wonderful. That's not what... No, I, I have to be honest with you. I don't actually think the Brit is a very good sugar daddy. That's not the word that I would... I know that that's what he is. That's how we met each other. That's how this happened. But interestingly enough, that is not in any way how I think about him. In fact, whenever that aspect of our relationship is brought up, like I always go like, oh, like, oh, right. (laughs) Why do you say he's not a good sugar daddy? What would be the perfect sugar daddy for me is someone that I enjoy spending time with, but maybe don't like that much. You know, like, like someone that I'm happy to see, like you know, maybe twice a month and just wants to give me lots of money. Interestingly enough, I just read an article that favorite person sent to me. Now she said it. Favorite person. Does it bother the Brit at all? Findoms. Have you ever heard of this, SD? Femdom. No, not fem. Fin. F-I-N as in financial. Mm-hmm. Doms as in dominatrix. So there are women who are in the sex industry and... They are fin doms. Like, quite literally, they do nothing for their clients, I guess you would call them. And all these people do, men, I, I think it's mostly men, I've never heard of a fin dom client woman. Um, all, of the, all these men do is just send them money. That's it. What? And they get nothing in return. It is insane. It, you know what? I'm going to send you the link so you could read this article. It's fucking crazy. And there's like, they just get off like there's some kind of weird fetish about just giving money. So they, they don't get anything in return. They, it's not like there's some kind of like Skype chatting <laughs> or, oh, I'll send you like my used panties in the mail. <laughs> Nothing like that. That doesn't interest me in the slightest. It doesn't even interest me to be someone who would be on the receiving end of... Like, I wouldn't want to be a fin dom. That just seems so, so one-sided, Yeah, you know? I know, because when you got started with your sugar baby thing, you almost had quite evangelical ideas about how you were going to sort of help these guys... <laughs> To, you know. Well, that was the angle that I found most interesting. The, the psychological aspect of it, you know, why someone would want a sugar baby and why they would want to pay someone to spend time with them. To know that there are so many different reasons why as well. I mean, I, I think people think of it and the stereotype is like, oh, well, you know, the guy must be really, really old or have some kind of deformity or he's really unattractive or, you know, it's like all of these like horrible stereotypes as to why someone would 
would have to pay for a woman's time and attention. And that's really, that's just not how it is at all, actually. Yeah, I guess. And there's also that aspect of um, some of the thrill being the secrecy of it. And I think some people enjoy the sort of cloak and daggers aspect of it. The last sugar baby date that I had, of course, not counting the Brit, was with a guy who was just visiting my city literally for like two nights. And he requested that I go out with him and he asked me to bring a friend along. I don't think I've told you this, Esty, have I? That I had a threesome recently. No, 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 you didn't tell oh, me Oh, yeah. I had a threesome recently. Can I just reason- check with the Brit? How do you feel about hearing about uh, Ruby's other escapades with other sugar daddies? Well, I've already heard about it. Right. So this is news to me. Do you feel okay about it? Is it, is it fine? Or still? I'm okay hearing about it, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to check. I mean, I'm really honest with everyone about everything. I mean, you know, favorite person knows everything. Brit knows everything about me. I'm just, I don't know. I I can't really function any other way. This is true, except it's not. There are a lot of family members who Ruby simply can't tell for fear of upsetting them. But I think she means those closest to her. Anyway, then Ruby starts telling me about the threesome. She mentions a woman who took part in it with her. For the purposes of the podcast... We'll call her Justine. Justine really gets off on having secrets. This is a conversation that she and I had together. Her husband knows nothing about what she does on the side, unlike mine. And she likes it that way. In fact, she actually keeps secrets from her other sexual partners. Because she sent me this one message explaining that the guy, she referred to him as her boyfriend. So I think she is really into this dude. It was his birthday. And that's why she asked me if I would... uh, Okay, basically I had two threesomes. Ruby's story gets a bit convoluted here. There's a sort of breathless quality to it, which makes me wonder if she's performing a bit for the Brit. Is this part of their relationship? Her telling him about her sexual escapades? Wait, does that mean I'm taking part in a sort of threesome right now? Ew. No, 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 no. So there was a threesome with a sugar daddy in which Justine participated for me as kind of a a, a favor to me, I suppose, because this guy requested it. And then... I'm starting to lose track of the story here. Was that, um, she was with the two and then there was another, but that was someone else. No, wait, I know. There were two threesomes, right? I was like, listen, I'm a sugar baby. He's going to be giving me an allowance. Do you want me to split it with you? Do you want a portion of it? And she just kind of looked at me like, oh, okay. Um, no, that's all right. You know what? You, you keep the money. I'm just doing it for the experience. And by the way, if you want to pay me back, this is what you can do. And so she requested that I have a threesome with her and her boyfriend. So that's how I know that she has this guy, she has another guy, she's married, and she keeps secrets from all of them. When I was about to meet the boyfriend, she asked me not to tell him certain things of what we had gotten up to together with the sugar daddy. I don't know why it shocked me. Like, is there no honor amongst thieves? (laughs) Like, you're both cheating on people. Surely you can be honest with each other, you know? But she wasn't. Yeah, that's that's really not my thing. Therein lies where these kind of relationships get murky. Britt, when when would you become troubled? Like, what would it take for you to be troubled by Ruby's other assignations? I mean, you're living in a, in a country where, you know, sexually transmitted disease is something that is really rife. And when would That's you... That's a fair think- question. Yeah, and I don't know the answer to that, actually. I probably wouldn't be. I'm feeling the urge to make something up <laughs> because that feels appropriate, but I probably wouldn't be. When we first met, it was very clear to me that Ruby had a number of sexual partners that came and went a bit, and I accepted that at the beginning. Uh, why would I not accept it now? It would feel wrong to me to say that I want her to change. <clears throat> it doesn't mean I'd like that to happen. It doesn't mean I'd be comfortable with it. Uh, I'd rather it didn't, but... And if it if it did, it did. Did she sort of turn around and she was kind of juggling, I don't know, 15 people? <laughs> 
Do you have any idea how long a session of sex is with me? 15 people would take up so much time. I would never sleep. I don't, I don't think it's, this is a question that's got a numerical answer. Uh, I suppose the real question is, do you have any rules as your relationships deepened? Have you said, well, I'm comfortable with this but I'm not comfortable with that. Or I need to know that you've taken this precaution and that precaution and you present me with a certificate each month of, of health <laughs> from no, the gynecologist. We, we, <laughs> we, we don't have any rules. And I think if either of us felt it necessary to ask questions like that, the best thing would be to go home, to be honest. I've never thought about it in such a concrete way, but the Brit is totally right. We don't have any rules, certainly no spoken rules. I, I think maybe if you really push the definition of what a rule is, you could say that honesty between us is a type of rule. It's certainly a, something that I like to live by, and I, I believe that the Brit does too. So if I wanted to take another lover, any kind of lover, whether it was a sugar daddy or something else, I would feel like I needed to tell him. And, and I, I, I would expect that he would tell me too if, if he wanted to sleep with someone else. Not that he would need to ask my permission, um, but just let me know that, hey, this is happening, this is going on in my life. So I, I think in terms of rules, maybe that's the only thing that you could kind of say is a rule, but you know, I don't even feel comfortable calling it a rule because it's not as if there's something that, that could be broken. Okay, let me put it this way. There's something worse that could be broken there than a rule, and that is the trust between us. Mm. So I feel like there is a huge amount of trust between us, and I feel like both of us take a lot of care of that trust. There are certain things that I would never do to break that trust, and I I believe the Brit. Like what? Well, I would never I would never sleep with someone else and not tell him. I would never lie about anything. I would never say that I'm off doing something when I'm really doing something else. I want to be fully known by this man. That's the thing. And the only way I'm going to be fully known by anybody is if I'm honest about me and my life. It hadn't occurred to me, interestingly enough, until you asked that question, but the fact that there are no rules between us is something that I really love. Uh-oh. I'm not sure about this no rules thing. Seems like something that could lead to misunderstandings down the line, especially in a polyamorous relationship which is surely ten times more complex than a regular one, and both of them are pretty new to polyamory. But maybe that's the fuddy-duddy in me talking. Maybe I'm just not getting it? It's something that makes me want this dynamic. It's something that draws me to the Brit. The fact that he is so very willing to embrace me. Literally. <laughs> and figuratively. <laughs> but aren't there any moments like that you sort of say you wouldn't lie about being somewhere where you weren't or something, but if you're like doing something horrible like wiping a baby's bum and you, you wouldn't you would want to appear a bit more glamorous, you might say, Oh, I'm just I'm wearing some nice lingerie and lounging on the sofa eating chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? That would probably be the smart thing to do. But you know what I do? I actually pepper the Brit with pictures of my little monkeys all the time. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, honey, so cute. I would probably not do that with anybody. I just, I would just omit the unglamorous domestic part of my life <laughs> with another sugar daddy or lover that I felt wasn't interested in all of me. They only want the, uh, the chocolate eating side of you. We were talking about earlier, the Brit and I, how he was, he felt he was kind of insulated from the complications of being involved with someone in a polyamorous relationship. Because I was saying, aren't you in a relationship with two other people instead of just the one? And he was saying, well, he feels he's actually insulated from the complications of that because you, you're sort of absorbing that. Just to, to teach you some lingo, in polyamorous lingo... I am referred to as the pivot. I'm the one in the middle. So I pivot this way, I pivot that way, and I absorb any kind of love or ire that comes from either direction. Pivot sounds a lot sexier than piggy in the middle, you know? <laughs> I think it was good that they... Well, I think sometimes I'm a piggy in the middle too, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you think 
there will ever be a day where FP and the Brits sort of meet face to face. I mean, we were talking not not dueling at dawn as we were talking about earlier, but just a, a sort of amicable coffee situation. Listen, I really hope so. That is where my brain goes. I'm not so sure the two monogamous men in my life are keen for that. If I could just write the script and have life be exactly the way I want it, that's what would happen. They would meet, they'd know each other. They wouldn't necessarily have to be friends, but I would like them to be friendly, you know? I would like them to be comfortable with each other. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, Britt, how do you feel about the sort of the level of love that you're getting from Ruby. Do you ever feel like maybe FP has something more than you? I, I think he gets more than me, and I think that's right. I mean, he's the father of Ruby's children, and so he should get the majority of her love and her time, and that's that's fine. I'm comfortable with that. That's how I, how I think it, it should be. And if I ever got to the stage where... I felt differently from that, which I think with the word we're searching for here is jealousy, then that would be a bad thing and not that would be an unhealthy situation and there wouldn't be a way back from there, I don't think. This is the third time the Brit has spoken, albeit obliquely, about the potential end of their relationship. He said he doesn't think it will work out ultimately, that if they had rules, they'd have to walk away. And now this, of the two of them, he seems to have a much more bleak view of what's happening between them. So you're sort of cautiously optimistic about just carrying on. Ruby is blindingly optimistic. <laughs> no, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm not optimistic. I'm an optimistic person, but in this case, I'm not particularly optimistic. Being honest about things, if you'd asked me a month ago whether I thought we'd be where we are now, I'd have said no. And two months ago, if you'd asked me we, where we'd be you know, a month ago, I'd have said no, that wasn't possible. So it keeps developing and it keeps developing in a way that surprises me. And, you know, there's, there are more good turns than bad. And so I wait to see whether I might be wrong. Hmm. Uh, it'd be lovely if I was. I'm not sure that I will be, but I'm not something I want to give up on because I think it would be worth it if it did work out. It sounds like you're using your, your businessman's brain. You're going, well, I'll take a punt on this and it uh, could pay huge dividends. <laughs> the stock share prices will go through the roof. And I'm sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I got Ruth caught up in that mental... something very similar to me recently about that. <laughs> she said I was analysing something as if it was a business proposition. I think she might have been talking about her. Um, no, but and and there, there may be some of that in it. I and mean, that is how I've spent my life. That is how my brain works. Well, so. that was my assessment. And I hope you remember. I think it's actually quite cute when you talk about us in a business-like fashion. It's because... That's the language that is most comfortable to you. So it makes sense that you'd want to express yourself in that way. I get that. Okay, well, so if I was writing an investor note today, it would be saying <laughs> hold stroke buy <laughs> rather than sell. It's a good thing you cut me off before I had to get more entangled in that metaphor because I was running out of <laughs> business terms that I knew. Thank you so much for chatting, both of you. I was saying to the Brits, Ruby, that my, my mind is much more... Uh, easy now that I've spoken oh, to him. Good. Yeah, you know, because I'm happy to hear that. I did ask him how he felt about dueling at dawn, and he seemed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Esty, only you, only you come up with this. You know that, really. <laughs> well, yeah, she came up with this idea of me fighting FP with a wet haddock. <laughs> You're a nut, lady. You're a total nut. Well, it's because I've been gorging on Georgia hair novels. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we will meet in the flesh at some point in the future that would be nice and that my friends was my conversation with the Brit it was illuminating and worrying in equal measure maybe I should be reassured that he considers it unlikely that their relationship will last it smacks of the realism which seems to characterize him he seems determined to ride it out until the penny drops and he has quite a few pennies to shower on Ruby also it was strange to hear Ruby describe his best qualities, kindness, caring for others, when he came across, well, not exactly warm. 
Maybe he has a quality of animal magnetism that's hard to convey across a phone line. More likely, he didn't trust me enough to let me get a glimpse of his true self. I finished the interview feeling that I'd failed you all a bit. I mean, I have no grandiose aspirations, this isn't news night or anything. But I feel like I should have been tougher, maybe? Ask more biting questions. But I don't want to upset Ruby because, no matter what, she appears to be falling in love with him. And there's something else. Something crucial that's been missing all along. The absence of someone so critical to this discussion. Favorite person. I wish I could get him to talk, to tell his side of the story. After speaking with the Brit, it's even more apparent to me what a contrast there is between the two men. Those qualities Ruby talked about with regard to the Brit? FP has them in spades. Plus, he's wise and funny. He loves philosophy and movies. I don't know, I, I just feel like you'd all fall in love with him if you could hear him telling you what he thinks about all this. But this isn't about taking sides and I have to remember that. Looked at another way, it's his absence that does tell us something important about him. He doesn't want to be a part of this. I mean, he's given us permission to do it. But it isn't important to him that a vast sea of strangers understand all his thoughts in this deeply personal story. In this day and age when it often seems as though the chief thing is the image you project to the world, that takes a kind of strength I don't think many of us have. And I believe both men have shown a sort of strength. The Brits in being brave enough to talk about something so taboo, and FP in choosing to let you decide for yourselves. We're going to take a little break for a few weeks. We've been waiting all season for the feminism episodes, and when we come back, we'll have two brilliant and hilarious episodes just looking at that. We'll also be catching up on the repercussions of Ruby's polyamorous setup. Ruby and FP's marriages in crisis. Are they going to split up? There'll be heartbreak, tears, and revelations next time on the Sugar Baby Confessionals. This podcast was produced and edited by me, Sarah May Chusen, with help from Beth Keen, Mike Scott, Geraldine Elliott, and Catherine Hoffmeyer. The music you've heard on this podcast comes from Danny Green's albums Obituaries and Leish, as well as Kristen McClement's album The Wild Grips. Find out more about Leish by going to leishmusic.com, that's L-A-I-S-H music.com, and hear Kristen's work at kristenmcclement.com. I hope you've enjoyed what we've been doing so far. If so, do let us know. We put a lot of work and love into it, and we really appreciate finding out what your thoughts are. Also, if you have any questions for Ruby, email us on fablegazers at gmail.com. Remember, if we get enough, we might create some bonus content with Ruby answering the best ones. Tweet us at fable underscore gazers or take a peek at our lovely Instagram account. We're fablegazers, one word. Rating, reviewing and subscribing is very much appreciated and helps to keep us going. Names and details have been changed to protect the anonymity of those involved. This has been a Fable Gazers production.